Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Gregory Wilpert. This coming Sunday, February 21, about 6 million Bolivians are being asked to vote in a referendum that, if it passes, would amend Bolivia's constitution and allow a president to serve three consecutive terms in office instead of only two. President Evo Morales of Bolivia is the first indigenous president of his country and was elected over 10 years ago in 2006. Since then, he has been re-elected two more times in 2009 and 2014, with his current term set to expire at the end of 2019. Although Morales is currently serving his third term, his term did not count, his first term did not count towards the constitutional limit because a new constitution was passed during his first term. Thus, under the current constitution, he cannot run for re-election yet another time. Although Evo Morales is a very popular president who won elections with overwhelming majorities, the constitutional referendum outcome seems to be unclear at this time. Further complicating the outlook is a recent revelation that the unmarried Morales might have had a child out of wedlock. Here to, with me today is Catherine Lederberg, who is the director of the Andean Information Network, which covers drug policy in the region and is based in Cochabamba, Bolivia. Hi, Catherine. Thanks for joining us at The Real News. Thanks so much for having me. So my first question is, Evo Morales has organized this referendum to amend the constitution, which would allow him to run for a fourth and final term. What would you say is the motivation behind this referendum? Well, I think the motivation is appealing on the part of the MAS government that there's not a rep another representative figure within MAS to continue the policy and a, a feeling or a need to or a desire to prolong their time in power. Uh, it's interesting, this is something that's met with opposition on the part of Morales foes and with great support on the on the part of uh, Morales fans. And it's a complicated issue. And I think, I think probably the Bolivian public is pretty well split in their opinions about it. Right, so that was right. actually going to be my next question is how does it look for the party uh, and for Morales um, which is campa who's, who's campaigning for the passage of Reverend. What do the polls say? And what do you see people on the streets say? Uh, and concretely, what are the criticisms that the opposition is raising? Well, I, I think it's important to note that, you know, polls initially showed a couple percentage points advantage for Morales, and maybe now they, most polls show that it's neck and neck or that there are a few percentage points going to the opposition. It's hard to use polls to gauge accurately uh, what the election outcome will be because polls often uh, underestimate the rural vote and the rural vote will tend to go to Morales. But that said, there's still a very large percentage in polls and I think that is an accurate a representation of undecided voters. I think there are a lot of people who have not yet decided and who feel very conflicted about this vote. And so right now I think it's hard to tell. I don't think you have consensus, and I think it's going to be an extremely close vote either way. Why do you think the outcome is so unclear, given that, uh, according to other polls, Morales' personal popularity is very high, and apparently, despite the economic problems that many other countries in Latin America are currently having, uh, Bolivia remains a relative success. So what do you, would you say are the main uh, reasons for um, for the uh, division, for this uh, closeness of the vote, given that uh, you'd think that if he's so popular, it should have been, should be an easy vote for him. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think that his popularity is clear, and even polls that show him slightly behind or tied will give him the greatest percentage of the question, if elections were to occur tomorrow, who would you vote for? The answer is Abel Morales. I think the issue goes beyond that in terms of the possibilities of a fourth term, uh, an issue of the viability of continuation in power. I don't think that the um, opposition's arguments have been strong or very specific. I I'm uh, surprised by a lack of substantive debate about the issue of term limits per se and whether or not they're important or unimportant. A, a lot of the complaints have been class-based or based on gossip or, or based on controversy, some that haven't been investigated, others that are based in fact. But I mean, I think the, the real concern behind this controversy of the woman that he had, had a child with is the concern that she used this relationship or this relationship enabled her to get a contract with a, or many contracts 
uh, for a Chinese company that she works with, the Bolivian Public Works. But of course, none of this has been investigated. It's not clear what the outcome would be. And so I, I think there, there are very mixed opinions, and I'm not sure how much this conflict will sway people who are already convinced. There's very, very little debate about the actual issue or the structure of democracy. I, I think that's, that's something that's really too bad. It's become a, a popularity contest of I like Evo or I don't like Evo, and really the, the larger issues of whether or not the ability to change the Constitution, whether or not four terms is a good thing, has really gotten lost in the shuffle. Um, and what about so? Just to go back to the um, to this uh, recently uh, revealed issue about this woman who had a relationship, who then secured relation a, a job with a Chinese company that benefited from government contracts. Does this look like a um, serious issue, or is it mainly something that uh, you would say perhaps is more opposition motivated? Given that, from what I've heard, uh, the journalist uh, who uncovered it is affiliated with the opposition. Uh, well, the person that uncovered it is clearly affiliated with the opposition. He held uh, high posts in, in, in previous governments. Um, and, I, you know, I would call him more of a political commentator or a host than a journalist. I, I mean, if these, if these allegations are in fact correct, it would be a very serious charge. But we haven't gotten to a place where there's been a systematic investigation into them. And that's something that needs to happen, investigative journalism, legal investigations. And we're not at that point yet. I, uh, certainly, um, it, political influence and contracts is nothing new in Bolivia. It's certainly something that... Uh, this would not be the last time if in fact it were true that it had happened, but this is in fact the first time that anything has been questionable directly attached to Morales. And, and, and it's not clear what the impact would be, but it's clear that the opposition kind of launched this right before the carnival season in order to create a furor and an uproar, and I think it's really distracted from the issues that really need to be discussed. And, and I think convert, Voters here are conflicted because there are people who don't feel a fourth term is appropriate, but yet do not feel that there are other viable alternatives on the playing field now. They don't feel that there are uh, promising opposition candidates. It's also important to note that some people don't understand that this allows Morales to run again for a fourth term elections that will occur uh, uh, not for another three years. And so what happens in this three-year period with or without a Morales election is also a, a big gray area right now. I think you're right that economic stability continues. This is uh, the International Monetary Fund projects the highest level of growth for Bolivia and all of South America. I mean, there's been a macroeconomic handling of the economy, which is a, a strong arguing point for Morales. We'll have to wait and see if it's strong enough. Um, just turning quickly to the economic issue, I mean. One of the problems that many countries, especially Brazil and Venezuela, have had, and I guess to some extent Argentina and Chile as well, is the decline in commodity prices, specifically, of course, uh, oil for uh, Brazil and for uh, Venezuela. What is a different, uh, how is Evo Morales managing the economy differently uh, that he seems to be emerging from this uh, decline relatively unscathed? Well, I, I think that there have been a lot of measures that this government has taken that have kind of cushioned this blow. It's obviously something that's been felt here. Uh, the growth has slowed, but there are also a great deal of international reserves. There are long-term contracts with Brazil and Argentina for the purchase of natural gas. Uh, at a price that is fixed. And at the same time that prices have gone down, the volume of natural gas produced by Bolivia has increased. And so they're able to offset uh, things that, uh, you know, a kind of crash that existed in Venezuela and a kind of economic, we've seen an economic slowdown and the government has certainly recognized and warned of that, but it's been a gradual slowdown and not a bottom falling out of the market. Of course, it is very difficult when your economy is based uh, largely on hydrocarbons. The government is planning to build a lot of dams and replace this energy and this income by selling um, 
output from hydroelectric dams to Brazil. It's another mixed bag issue. But we're certainly not seeing here the same kind of impacts we've seen in other countries. And I think it's really important to point out because it's very frustrating in the mainstream press to hear these regional characterizations or a lumping together of countries without looking at the unique dynamic in play in each one. And I think the Bolivian policy and Bolivian politics is something that's homegrown and it's really hard to lump it into any category. Uh, one last thing before we leave. You specialize in the region's drug policies. Uh, what can you say just briefly about uh, Morales' drug policies? Have they been effective and does this at all bear on the referendum? Well, it's interesting because I, I would say that, you know, in terms of the biggest damage done by the drug trade for many, many decades in Bolivia, it was the violence around forced eradication funded by the United States. It's interesting to note that the Morales government has implemented a program that is largely negotiated erad uh, eradication or coca reduction, working with communities with the support of the European Union and uh, the permission of a small amount of coca with a shift to the importance of subsistence for coca growing families instead of criminalizing them or or measuring hectares reduced. It's interesting to note that this meets the traditional yardstick because coca production in Bolivia has gone down 34 percent in the last four years. So in terms of coca reduction and supply side control, the program has definitely been a success. At the same time, the development efforts, the integrated development with COCA efforts that have been supported also by the European Union have given farmers for the first time, uh, for the first time a chance to complement their income and to diversify. And this is being seen internationally as a model with recognition from the United Nations, from the European Union, from the Organization of American States. So if we look at drug policy on the supply side control, I, I would say that this is a huge success. This isn't something that's gotten any recognition from the United States. This is interesting that it's been done with the expulsion of U.S. Uh, development agencies and drug control agencies and the end of all U.S. funding at the end of fiscal year 2013. So it's an uncomfortable example. It's certainly something that... Um, People had predicted there would be a, a collapse or, or the erosion of Bolivia into a narco state, something we really haven't seen happen. In fact, with a much smaller budget and with these homegrown policies, Bolivia has met U U.S. yardsticks much better than the countries they still fund, Colombia and Peru. And so it's interesting that within Bolivia, there isn't a lot of recognition for this either. It's important to know that the coca issue and coca production and, the, and where the U.S. came down on it was a decisive issue in Bolivian politics for so many years. And now it's really been taken off the table. And it really depends on who you are, if your perception that drug control is going very well, but also a lot of the... The gossip-based news and the suggestion uh, suggests drug trafficking is out of control, which is a very inaccurate assessment. You know, we're still the smallest coca-producing country, the smallest cocaine-producing country, uh, the country where the drug trade is the least profitable. But this hasn't been a big factor in Bolivian public opinion. It, it's really become a popularity contest, or yes or no. And, and within that, there are people who are interested in the structure of democracy, and then there are people who are falling down largely on class and racial lines, which is something that is not surprising. But, but, it, but to see these kind of distinctions and divisions persist after 10 years is an important reminder that we have a long way to go still in Bolivia. Thank you, Catherine, so much for joining us here at the Real News Network. Uh, with me was Catherine Lederberg, the director of the Andean Information Network. And thank you for joining us at the Real News Network.